Humans have been telling each other stories for a very long time now, so I think we've all gotten pretty used to films following a certain set of rules of classical storytelling. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, I mean, those rules exist because most of the time they, well, because they work. And Blade Runner 2049 begins by acting like it's going to make a lot of those same conventional choices. We get a deeply oppressed protagonist who starts out as a character without any notoriety or significance to the world. And even more than most, Joe also keeps with the tradition of being an orphan. He starts to unravel the significance of an emotionally charged childhood memory, which naturally turns out to be a dangerous secret that reveals his shocking origin story. One that, of course, sets him at the dangerous center of a major conflict between the established powers that be. Pretty typical stuff. But instead of following through on that expectation, the story suddenly takes a hard left turn. Because Joe isn't anyone important. He was churned out in Wallace's replicant factory just like everyone else. And the genuine real life actually happened memory he's been carrying around in his head and unraveling at great personal risk doesn't even belong to him. Joe isn't important. And it's worth taking note that the writers didn't only make a decision to center the story on someone conspicuously missing the usual protagonistic significance. Screenwriters Hampton Fancher and Michael Green chose to start Joe in an unremarkable place, and then went out of their way to build him all the way up, only so they could get him as high as possible before shoving him over the edge to come crashing back down again. Joe isn't important. And that's a very, very pointed decision in storytelling but aimed at accomplishing or communicating what, exactly? There's heaps of Christ imagery going on in the character of Rachel and Deckard's daughter, the messianic Dr. Anna Staline. But besides that, she also fills a more general trope of basically all religious myths. One of a divine figure bestowing the symbolic gift of fire, or the breath of life to the ancestors of mankind, or giving a legendary item to a hero. Are they all constructed, or...? Do you ever use ones that are real? It's illegal to use real memories, officer. Illegally sending out one of her own memories was certainly a reaction to having spent her entire life isolated and alone. The kind of devouring loneliness that meant it didn't matter who it was as long as for even just a moment she got to share one honest piece and I'd say the most defining piece of herself and have a real connection with someone. Anyone, which ends up being Joe. He's forced to take these baseline tests that are meant to detect the signs of emerging humanity in the new generation of replicants. But what's interesting is that the questions aren't focused on any contraband or rules the replicants have broken. Instead, they're meant to ferret out whether Joe and other replicants are acutely emotionally aware of the places of emptiness inside themselves and their lives, or not. The unfulfilled impossible desires the restrictive bondage and abuse, and the unanswered questions about their own nature and place in existence, especially related to their creators. So when I say that Anna Staline fits the divine mythological archetype, it's because the gift of a part of her own desolate childhood, plucked directly from her own mind, is the catalyst for Joe developing what the story holds up as a sign of fully formed humanity. It feels authentic. And if you have authentic memories, you have real human responses. Wouldn't you agree? And that sensation of internal emptiness is a trait that largely defines all the other main players in the story too. Wallace and his obsession with using innovation to constantly reaffirm his place as a god among his fellow men, the murderous hunger his enforcer love has for her master's approval, and the compulsion she feels to keep proving she's his best creation. Deckard's loss of Rachel and his daughter, and Anna's life that lacks a family, human connection, or intimacy of any kind. And that's exactly what Blade Runner 2049's subversive story offers to us in Joe. A protagonist who has no secret past, no special abilities or strengths or weapons, no legendary status or significance, no importance at all. But we get to see both the anxiety and validation of desperate hope he feels when he believes he's the child, and his broken silence when he finally realizes that he isn't. You imagined it was you. We all wish it was us. What we do get to do is watch Joe make choices. 
He doesn't single-handedly defeat the evil represented by his godlike creator Wallace, and he also doesn't climactically bring about the liberation of his countless fellow replicants. Both of those things are utterly and completely beyond Joe's abilities to accomplish. But he makes a choice to be brave in the face of great danger and almost guaranteed failure. He chooses to remember that there's someone else out there who, because of the defining memory they share, feels exactly like he does. And he chooses to bring a father back to his daughter, even if it means he has to die to do it. There are an endless supply of great stories going as far back as humans have been telling stories of heroes who are extraordinary in every sense of the word. They sweat significance and bleed providence. And while those sorts of veritable demi-deity characters have always been meant to serve as a symbol of inspiration and aspiration to those hearing the story, sometimes they're so far above us that our personal connection with them risks becoming so tenuous as to be damn near non-existent. And I think that's the objective, careful, pointed subversion accomplishes in Blade Runner 2049. Joe doesn't connect with us by speaking to some fantasy of who we as the audience wish we were or could be, but to who and what we actually are, and to the nobility that it's possible to find there. Because the truth is, humanity isn't only or even mostly defined by the emptiness we all often feel, but also importantly, by how we decide to try and fill it. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see others like it, make sure to show me by hitting like and subscribing.